Hey folks, Fred Delory here and welcome to On Background where we dive deep into Canadian politics from the perspective of uh, a few friends or foes having a beer or two and telling war stories if we got them. Today, we're focusing on a uh, remarkable trend, Pierre Polyev's dominance in the political landscape, leading in every province across Canada, with one striking exception. Uh, this province, known for its uh, distinct language, culture, and unique political stories of its own, stands out as the constant outlier. Yes, of course, I'm talking about Quebec. So. To explore Quebec politics, both at the federal and provincial levels, I'm joined by a longtime friend and colleague, Dimitri Sudas. While many in English Canada no doubt recognize Dimitri as the former press secretary and director of communications for Prime Minister Stephen Harper, his influential role as Quebec advisor during Harper's leadership remains uh, less known, but just as, or maybe even more important, uh, it, particularly in this chat we're about to have. So, Together, we're going to uh, try to unravel the complexities of Quebec's political scene and its significant departure from the national trend. And maybe we'll see an eventual convergence. So, Dimitri, look, uh, thanks for, for joining me for this chat on Background. Hey, Fred. Good to see you, buddy. Great to see you again. Um, look, this is obviously a, a, an English podcast for an English audience. Um I always, you know, obviously growing up in English Canada, knew Quebec's different, different language. I never really understood how different the culture was, though. It wasn't just a translation difference. Uh, I married a French Canadian uh, and I learned the, the, you know, you have your own stars, your own TV shows. Uh, my wife never grew up watching, uh, you know, doesn't have the same points of reference, never grew up watching Friends and, uh, and Seinfeld. She grew up watching Quebec TV shows. Um, so... I think it's it's one of those things that people need to understand the tremendous difference between the English culture and French culture in this country, where you have, you know, I'm heavily influenced by American uh, TV shows, movies, um, and I'm sure you watch them in Quebec as well, but you have your own homegrown talent there. Right. And and, and make no mistake, Fred, I mean, the founding of our country, um, the, the two founding nations, um, one on the British side, one on the French side. Uh, French from France, uh, and, and obviously the, the British founders, uh, Upper Canada, Lower Canada. It, it is it is beyond a translation. And if you remember uh, when we were planning election ads uh, for the election campaigns that we worked on together, uh, 04, 06, 08, 11, um, we never just took an English ad and simply uh, run it through Google Translate, although Google Translate didn't exist back then. Right. Uh, and, and that just aged us quite a bit just by saying that. Um, you have to appeal to to literally, it's like you're campaigning in another country. Right. Um, and, and that distinction goes well beyond, uh, well, goes well beyond language. Um, and, and the biggest challenge right now for the Conservative Party, since the new Conservative Party was created, uh, back in 2004, is the existence of the Bloc Québécois. Um, if you remember, before that, uh, under Brian Mulroney, for example, even under John Diefenbaker, uh, Conservatives would win a significant amount of seats uh, in the province of Quebec. Um, well, every 40 or 50 years here, though, we're not, it wasn't a constant trend that we were, that we were doing that well. Like, if you go from Diefenbaker to Mulroney, we had one MP, I think. Right. But at the same time, the other reality is the liberals have governed two thirds of, of yeah. the history of this of this country. But the point is the main roadblock to, you know, when 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 Quebecers want change, when they're fed up with, say, the liberals in this case, which which seems to be the pattern right now, um, they have two alternatives, uh, the Bloc Québécois and the conservatives. Now, at the same time, going to what Mr. Polyev is trying to achieve He's diverting from the strategy that we took uh, for all four election campaigns, all four to, to all the way to 2015. He's diverting completely from what Andrew Scheer did, um, completely diverting, quite frankly, from what Aaron O'Toole did, which was appeal to Quebec nationalism. You know, we talked right. about recognizing the Quebecois nation, giving a seat to Quebec on UNESCO, solving the fiscal imbalance. He's, he's basically translating his English Canada approach to Quebec, talking about the economy, talking about housing, talking about, um, you know, just a few weeks ago, he was in Quebec City uh, for his Quebec tour. 
and he talked about pegging immigration numbers uh, to new constructions uh, of homes. He's talking about taxes, right. he's talking about the economy. So it's a new approach. Is it going to work? It's going to require more than that. Um, That's interesting because you're, you're right. He is doing something we've um, we've never done before. I remember in uh, our, our favorite campaign when we got the majority in 11, our our slogan in English Canada was here for Canada and the French equivalent was here for the regions, right? Like we were campaigning about because Quebec is a regionalized uh, province as well. Um, right. And, and, and furthermore to that, our slogan was les régions prennent des forces. Regions are getting stronger. Right. And, and we chose that slogan at the time. It was almost as if we were campaigning against Montreal. Um, <laughs> right. Because for Montrealers or the Montreal establishment, uh, Quebec is Montreal. Whereas if you look at the regions of Quebec, there are mo many more similarities between people living in the regions of Quebec with Ontarians living in Northern Ontario. With oh, absolutely. I'm from they have rural, much more in common. Yeah. I'm from rural Nova Scotia and rural Quebecers and uh, rural uh, Franco-Ontarians, uh, all the same uh, in many, many ways. There's no question. Um, so, uh, yeah, it makes sense in that regard. So it's interesting that Pierre's doing this. He's breaking the mold in a sense. Um and the numbers are pretty, you know, we're seeing some growth there, right? Like he is up a high, higher than uh, we were in the last election and the one before that. Um, but does he break through? Um, we, we, we will not We will not have the answer to that question until about seven days before the elections. And, and why do I say that? Um, Quebecers pay attention to politics. They love politics, uh, but they pay attention to provincial politics. This is what they talk about right. at the Tim Hortons today, tomorrow, last week. Uh, they talk about the premier. They talk about what's happening with a PQ. Federal politics is distant, whereas in Ontario, for example, uh, most Ontarians don't even know where Queen's Park is. Federal politics is the politics that they talk about every day. Yeah, and I think Ontario may be the exception uh, in that. I think a lot of the other provinces are more like Quebec. I know as a Nova Scotian, we, we really, Nova Scotia is the center of our universe. Um, but I do think Ontario uh, is, is different. I agree with you on that. And, and again, uh, just last week, uh, Mr. Poiliev went into Quebec, uh, and as soon as he left, uh, again, as he's trying to build his narrative, uh, went after the mayor of Montreal and Quebec City and, and called them a bunch of incompetents. And for, for, for a few hours, you saw the elite, the pundits, the commentators um, trying to go after him and say, uh, you know, this, this is not how a prime minister should behave. This is not prime ministerial. At the same time, I'm talking to my buddies in Montreal who are not traditional conservative voters. And they're saying, damn right, they are incompetent. Uh, and, and this housing crisis, um, I, I think to their own detriment, the liberals have taken on an issue that quite frankly, they have very little impact on actually resolving because the issue of housing, of, of homes getting built, of permits being issued, uh, it's at a municipal level, right? And 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 again, Pierre is going out there across the country on that, right? Like he's and it's not just he hasn't just attacked those mayors. He's gone after uh, city councilors in Toronto. He's gone after the mayor of Vancouver. Um, but to your point about um, uh, about housing and the, the liberals not being able to to uh, to message on it, you said they've taken this on, I, but I feel, I feel like. Paul Yev has made this the story though, right? Because his his discipline approach and his communications approach on this has been just, he's been hammering them. He has been hammering them. Look, look what he's done with the carbon tax. Um, his predecessors were shy and and, and yeah. coy on, on taking on. I mean, Aaron O'Toole um, adopted, Very shy. The liberal, uh, <laughs> adopted the liberal position on the, yeah. on the carbon tax. I wouldn't quite tax. agree with you there, but yeah, uh, it certainly wasn't the, the same as, uh, as Andrews or, or Pierre's. Whereas, whereas Mr. Poilievre is, is literally saying, let's have a carbon tax election. You want a right. carbon tax? I don't want a carbon tax. Let Canadians decide. Um, but isn't that, but, and right now, economy and inflation and cost of living is the, the hot issue. So that, that works. But if this was a, a, an election number of years ago or in a few years, if the economy is booming again, it goes back to an, the environment rises up and that becomes risky for us. So that works now uh, if the election's today. And, and, and Brian Mulroney used to say Mother Teresa is not on the ballot. Uh, at the end of the day, you take the circumstances of the day right. and, and you turn them to your advantage and you make them the ballot question. 
And what he's, what I seem to be seeing is that he's trying to spread the issues of housing, interest rates, cost of living, grocery shopping. He, he's spreading out his attack lines. And the reality is, do we really think in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, the current government will have solved these issues? Yeah, of course they're not going to be able to, right? So you're right. So it is something that uh, on all of that that he can attack on. Now, this is a big issue in Quebec, uh, the housing issue, um, big issue in all of Canada. And that's where I don't get like if it's it, it, it is a big issue in Quebec, right? Like, tell me about that. Is it not? Because his message, he's pounding it so hard across the country and it's working for him in every province. Why is it not working there? Is there, is it, maybe it, it again, he has risen a few points in the polls there. Uh, some polls have him uh, maybe even higher. Um, but is there something with just the, the brand of the conservative party? Is there a, an issue with just the, his, obviously historically it's only 40 or 50 years. We, we, we sweep and then we go back to single digits for a long time. Now we're at, you know, Harper did build something. So we do have a base there. So there, there is one more element in my view, um, and, and I'll put it simply, although it's not as simplistic as that. Um, I always used to tell Prime Minister Harper, Quebecers vote with her heart, while the rest of Canada votes with its brain. So so Mr. Poilievre's second phase or, or other obstacle is he needs to connect with Quebecers on an emotive skill. They need to like him. Now, he has a few advantages here that his predecessors, including Prime Minister Harper, did not have. His French is beyond excellent. It is better than Stephen Harper's French. Right. Um, his wife is a Quebecer. Yeah, doesn't hurt. His last name is a Francophone last name. Right. Um, so, but again, it is, Quebec is an uphill battle. And, and what we're seeing in the rest of the country is not just leading in every province, uh, Fred, um, he's leading in every single demographic. Right. Uh, when do you remember us leading? Never, among never. Women never, voters. Never, never. When do you remember us leading amongst, you know, the, the 25 to 40 year old? You know, a couple of months ago, uh, my wife and I went to the car dealership to pick up uh, her, her new car. And there was a 22 year old young man. And I always find a way to focus group everybody that I meet. <laughs> and and without, ever, with, without ever telling them, obviously, that. I, I, I love politics and I used to be in politics. So this 22-year-old young man, um, the first time he ever voted was uh, the last election. And I asked him, who did you vote for? He said, I voted for the NDP. I said, who are you voting for next time around? I uh, said, well, I'm voting conservative. Obviously, I'm voting for Polyev. And I'm like, how can you reconcile going from the NDP to the conservatives? And he basically literally hammered back uh, messages that, that right. Mr. Poliev has been has been has been in such a disciplined fashion. And his social media, he must be aggravating Prime Minister Trudeau like there is no tomorrow on how well he's managing oh, there's no social question. media. I've uh, I've often said the the biggest news network in Canada is Pierre Poliev. He's he's drowning everyone it's, out. His reach is further than anyone else. He's constantly doing every couple hours. He's putting out a message. It's 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 he's doubled down on what the liberals and Justin Trudeau did in 2015 to defeat us. Right, right uh, uh, on steroids. Um, it's interesting if you look at the, you know, we I, we both mentioned Maroney and Diefenbaker, those big sweeps where we swept Quebec and we had the the two largest majority governments. A lot of the polling aggregators um, and people that put out the, those models are showing the Conservative Party plus 200 seats across the country. That's without Quebec, though. Maroney and Diefenbaker swept Quebec. I can't imagine what this could look like if a wave does build in Quebec. And like you said, I, and I agree with you, I think it'll be seven days before Election Day before we start seeing that wave build. That's when it seems to happen uh, in a lot of areas, particularly in Quebec. Um, like... Peter McKay uh, supposedly said at the convention uh, that was in Quebec City last fall, I wasn't there, but I'm told he he told the crowd um, that we could win 58 seats in Quebec. Now, I don't know what he's basing that on, but if a wave builds, like, <laughs> could you imagine 260, 70 seats out of 343 in the next election? Like, that's insane. Do you think Jack Layton imagined sweeping Quebec uh, of course on, not. on the first day of the 2011 election campaign? Um 
Quebecers don't show their cards. And, and there's an expression in French that says, quand ça swing, ça swing, which means when Quebec decides to swing, it swings en masse. Right. Um, and, and what's going to be interesting to watch in Quebec over the next little while um, is how Quebecers, and what I say over the next little while, because Fred, if there's one rule we learned from Doug Finley is elections matter. Yeah, um, 100%. And, and really that's when things are going to start materializing as to whether or not Mr. Poliev can hold on to this massive lead that he currently has. You know, a year to a year and a half is a long time to sustain this. How do you sustain it, even if the economic factors don't change? Right. Um, even if we continue to be in, in, in an economic phase where growth is slow, where uh, interest rates remain high, where, let's admit it, the, crising, uh, the housing crisis won't be resolved. How does he sustain this? Then how does he match up those two elements? And in Quebec, it's really those two elements. How does he, because he's, he's chosen a different path. And I think he's right, to be honest with you. We tried it so many times. And uh, outside of the 10 strongholds that we have in Quebec, that regardless of who the candidate is, we will still win them. Yeah. Um, we collectively failed to, to make serious inroads in the province of Quebec. Um, how does he capture, now that he, he's clearly captured the minds, uh, with with his message, his big challenge, uh, and he has what it takes uh, because of the reasons that I mentioned, his last name, how he speaks French, his wife being French, he needs to capture the heart of Quebecers, and uh, it's going to be one hell of a problem to manage if he wins more than two hundred seats. Because I got to tell you, no yeah. prime minister should ever want to win so many seats. That's a lot of mouths to feed, right? That's uh, that's a lot of work. Uh, we're, we're seeing it now with the Liberals. They have a minority government and they have a hard time keeping uh, their own caucus in, in, uh, in line. So look, um, provincially, I'm interested too. And I think that's one of the things that makes Canada unique is we, you know, we don't have a coalition partner in this other uh, province where you know, in, in the UK, um, there's in, in Ireland and whatnot, there's parties there that basically run in Ireland and form coalitions if it works out with the Conservatives or, or side with them. In Australia, we have, uh, you know, the small C Conservative Party, the, the Liberals there, they're called, and the Nationalists have a coalition. I'm always curious what it would look like in Canada, and I'm not advocating for this, I'm just saying I'm curious, if the Conservative Party never ran candidates in Quebec. And I'm not saying we would ever align with the bloc. They're a separatist party, so they're out right away. But what if we had a federal CAQ? A, uh, they have your own leader, uh, and you automatically sit uh, at the cabinet table with the conservatives. And you could also, obviously, each election jump around. You could, you, you don't have to make a deal with the conservatives. You could make deal with uh, if the liberals were to uh, to achieve it. Now, them being the primary opponent, in Quebec, probably not going to happen but what is this something that could ever happen and if let's just say it could if you've snapped your fingers would it work i i don't see how something like this could or would happen and it would result in anything that is governable um at the end of the day we we, we are a two-party uh, system uh in english canada uh, the emergence of the bloc after the progressive conservatives fell apart, which on one hand, the Reform Party was founded and the other hand, the, the Bloc Québécois. So at, at the end of the day, uh, and you saw it in 2011, the Bloc Québécois collapsed. Um, the Bloc Québécois did not rebuild by gaining, by winning a little bit more than 30 seats, if, if, if I'm accurate here, but they have more than 30 seats in Quebec. That vote was not a vote uh, to vote for a, a separatist party. Right. It was an anti-liberal vote. Right. Uh, because within the bloc, you have people who are more um, on the socialist side, you have conservatives. Um, it's all about appealing to a, a significant percentage of the bloc voter uh, that is primarily living outside of Montreal, who, to whom the conservative leader, because it, it's not about voting for a party, it's, it's we, we vote for leaders. Um, and yeah. and whether it's just, and, and again, Another challenge for, for Mr. Poilievre is his two opponents in Quebec, they're both Quebecers, uh, Justin right. Trudeau right. and Yves-François Blanchet. Now, if the Liberals make the big mistake, and I'm a big proponent of, it would be a huge mistake for the Liberals to swap Justin Trudeau out for anybody else. If the Liberals make the mistake to push Justin Trudeau out, um, 
and their next leader is not from Quebec, that opens uh, a lot of opportunity for Mr. Poliev. Right. That's a very good point of Trudeau leaves. Uh, I always looked at it from the angle that I just think you'd put in someone without the experience and ability to campaign because Trudeau has proven maybe bad at governing, but very good at campaigning. Right. He's won three elections. Yeah. Three in a row. Um, and and furthermore argue. to that, I always say it, he's undefeated. He won a difficult nomination battle um, right. in, in the riding that I was born in, in Papineau. Oh, Papineau. Because uh, Dion at, at, at that time didn't want him, didn't want to give him Outremont, which was a safe seat. Yep. So he I remember had that. To win, and he went he through had to win a contested and a block seat. Battle. It wasn't a liberal seat. That's right. Uh, then he won the leadership race. Uh, sorry, he won a nomination. He won his seat as a member of parliament. He won the party's leadership race. And he's won every single federal election campaign. Uh, he, he is still undefeated. Right. That's Politically, a... nobody has ever beaten Justin Trudeau. Right. Uh, so so I think... Now, here's the issue. interesting thing. Pierre Polyev has that same record. Maybe a different well, path, but... At the, end Poly- of the next, at the end of the next election, one of those two will no longer be undefeated. That's right. <laughs> That's why, I, and as, as many have been saying, it's going to be an epic fight next time out. Um, so you don't think a provincial uh, a provincial wing of a federal party like a, a separate thing could work? I, I, I don't. I, I don't think that it's politically viable. Um, I, I think that the Conservative Party needs to continue. You know, we're, we're a relatively young party still. Um, right. You're if, looking if you at look us at... as born in 03, not uh, 18. Right. Right. And, 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 and I, I think you have to play the long game build the party, riding by riding. You know, I was so disappointed when Alain Ayes uh, quit the caucus. Um, I, I think that decision was dictated more by emotion than anything else because he had supported Jean Charest. Uh, that was one seat that we held uh, thanks to a strong candidate that we could have built on. Um, right. So, no, I, I don't think that some form of weird alliance with Eric Duhem, who we both know, uh, has, yeah, has yeah. founded the the Conservative Party of Quebec. Um, it has proven to be, you know, a party that had a lot of support during the pandemic, um, but it's it's also falling apart there as well. So I, I think we need to stick with the strategy of the Conservative Party of Canada must um, build roots in Quebec. It it might just take a little bit more time. Yeah, I think, I guess, uh, at the end of the day, if it's something that the party hasn't tried before, because there we went decades and decades without winning seats in that province, you think that would have been the time to explore this? Now we well, do de- have a Decades beachhead, and decades. Right? In the 90s, Kretching was sweeping the province. Um, yeah, and Trudeau Sr. swept the province over and over, right? Right. Um, so this was a long time, um, uh, you know, a long time drought for the Conservative Party. But Mr. Harper and, and yourself working with him, did build a beachhead there. Like we have 10 seats now. Uh, 10 seats Quebec. that we win come hell or high water. Over 50% of the vote, right? Like we do better in Correct. those seats. Correct. A lot of Ontario. They are they are Alberta Canada. style safe seats. They are. Yeah, it's fascinating. And 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 I will say this. I, I, I think that the party in Quebec just needs to play the long game. Um, and it's going to be interesting to watch whether the strategy that Mr. Poiliev is using, which his predecessors did not use, um, will 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 bear any fruit in terms of electoral results. So I got I have to ask something right now. You keep saying uh, something that has triggered me a bit. Um, <laughs> you and I, I've known you for twenty years. You and I have known Pierre for twenty years. We were kids on the hill together. Uh, you keep calling him Mister Poliev all the time. Uh, we're having a beer here, Dimitri. Like, what's the <laughs> so. When when we were when we were in opposition, uh, when when Mr. Harper was leader of the Canadian Alliance, everybody used to call him Stephen, um, and oh, right. I called and I called him Mr. Harper, and he turns to me one day and he says, "Why do you keep calling me Mr. Harper?" He says, "I'll be the only person that won't need to transition uh, to calling you Mr. Harper, or Prime Minister, after you win the next election." So, okay. it's 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 I guess it's the way my mom brought me up. That's awesome. No, I appreciate that. That's great. I will uh, I will try to do better myself. I guess. Um, so look, provincially we're seeing the PQ first place in the polls. Yep. Is that real? Is this like, it's it, to it the point be. about how it's the block do well, not because of separatism, but because of, uh, I, I think the block do well, cause it's just, it's an anti-liberal vote. Uh, in 2019, I think that vote was coming to us. I think we were going to, to clean up there. 
the NDP voted collapse then. Um, and Andrew Scheer and abortion during that campaign, I think, sunk us um, and gave life to the block. Um, but now we're seeing, you know, in Quebec, the CAQ, the, the France, Francois Legault party, uh, is governing party. They've done well in the last two elections, cleaned up. Uh, the liberals seem to be kind of out of it. And, the you know, the new conservative party, the provincial conservative party, um, I think they had some issues they ran on, hot issues last time, but they, that seems to have dissipated as well, right? Right. And and kind of some of the historical context here is from, from the 1970s until 2018, um, Quebec voters went to the polls uh, and every single time the ballot question was the same. Uh, do you want Quebec to separate from Canada? Right. If the answer is yes, you voted PQ. If the answer is no, you voted for the provincial liberals. So what Francois Legault, and, and again, Francois Legault, who is a former PQ minister, um, was a, a sovereignist, uh, possibly still is. Uh, he just doesn't run on it. He, he, he proposed something different to Quebecers. He said, why don't we make the debate about healthcare? Why don't we make the debate about education? Why don't we make the debate about the economy? And, and his party's name, CAQ, is Coalition Avenir Québec. His party is literally a coalition of federalists, nationalists, and sovereignists. And he won a historic election in 2018. Then came the pandemic, uh, where for two years, um, all his government really did was manage the pandemic. He was reelected in 2022 uh, with an overwhelming majority, winning more seats. Than right. He, he, he added, which is quite unusual. So truly speaking, this is his first mandate because... From 2022, and this is the first mandate of the Coalition Avenir Quebec, because now they will have to govern. They went through some very difficult negotiations uh, with the public service, with teachers unions, uh, with nurses. The first mandate, Quebecers re-elected him because of how he managed the pandemic. I mean, he was literally walking on water. Uh, right. He was the most popular premier during the pandemic. Uh, Quebecers needed reassurance. Uh, and and he was the one to provide that reassurance to them. So the real test is 2026. Uh, was was the election of the CAC um, a one time wonder? And is he still going to be able to keep this coalition together? Uh, listen, they they've made some pretty bad mistakes. Like for example, their finance minister, who I gather wanted to run. Uh, federally uh, for us, for the Conservatives, mm -hmm. um, went out and made a monumental mistake. He gave out $7 million to bring the Los Angeles Kings to the Quebec City uh, arena oh, wow. uh, for, two for two exhibition games. Oh, wow. <laughs> I thought for he was trying to make a pitch for to two, move the team. For, no, just for two exhibition games, paying for the lunches and hotels of millionaire hockey players and, and of billionaire hockey team owners. So they, they've mishandled a few files. Um, so the premier went away during the holidays. The rule was nobody call me until January 15th. Uh, he instructed all his ministers, except a couple of them who were responsible for the, the negotiations with the unions and said, everybody needs to take a deep breath. Everybody needs to go rest. And guess what? He's now come back. And Fred, listen to this one. He has five priorities. Does that ring a bell? It does. <laughs> so... So he's got to focus now. He's back he's, on track. He, he, well, he, we'll see. But he has five priorities. Those are education, healthcare, economy, environment, and identity and culture. Um, his caucus, he's expecting discipline and cohesion. Um, is he going to be able to put things back on track? He'll have to be judged based on some pretty high standards that he said. He said he's going to fix the education system. He's going to fix the healthcare system. Um and the rise of the PQ, they've elected a leader who is a very savvy communicator. Oh, um, younger generation, Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon, um, he sees the issue of the oath to the king and literally forced the National Assembly. He said, I'm not walking into that to the National Assembly, the legislature, until um, the oath to the king becomes uh, optional. Uh, and he said, I'm not taking my oath. I will not start my political career with a lie. Um, whereas all the his PQ predecessors obviously took that oath. That has been right. changed now in Quebec City, uh, taking the oath to the king. And by the way, there's a private member's bill in Ottawa that's calling for something similar. I think it's from a liberal. Um, so, so that debate 
Uh, it's a private member's bill from a liberal, from your neck of the woods, I think, uh, Fred. Oh, really? Uh, Atlantic Canada. Um, so something to watch, because I, I think that debate is coming. So back to, to Paul Saint-Pierre Plamondon. He's also promising a referendum in the first mandate of the PQ. Oh, he's going right. So that's the that's the ballsy move we haven't seen he's, for a while, right? We for have the PQ, not seen. They've been kind of not, they they've been tiptoeing around it, and you know. So we're going right back into this. Hey, is this is this what we're heading? Because they're they're first in the polls. If the CAQ again, you know, if, if they collapse, we're going right back into this whole fight for Canada. We're going back, and he's he's already tabled. He said, "This is what my budget is going to look like." No, he's full steam ahead on on committing unequivocally to holding a referendum uh, during his first mandate. Uh, and the Provincial Liberal Party, that is in complete and utter disarray. Uh, really? The recent election, uh, the Liberal Party of Quebec had its worst showing since Confederation. Uh, they are currently leaderless. Uh, the election is in 2026 to the point where nobody wants to run to be leader of the Quebec Liberal Party. Uh, and they've pushed off their leadership race till 2025. And the last provincial election was in 2022. Wow. Okay. Do you remember Denis Coderre? I do. I do. The he, former MP has, and mayor, yeah, right? an immigration Montreal. minister, former mayor of Montreal. He's announced that he is seriously considering running for. It's the not bad. The PLQ. Wow. It is. It is. It is. It is to that point, and that means if if the if if Hoswa Legault cannot get his government's act together. We're back to the same ballot question. Uh, and what will that mean? Because you have ministers like Simon Jolin Barret, who is a nationalist slash sovereignist. You have some great ministers like Geneviève Guilbeault, the deputy premier of Quebec, who's a federalist, or Christian Dubé, who is the, the health minister, who's also a federalist. So this coalition can fall apart very quickly right. if things repolarize to what they were uh, for well over 40 years. Interesting times in Quebec. It is that this is very, uh, very fascinating. I didn't realize that the PQ was actually gearing up for that actual uh, constitution fight or, or they're making it separate. They're, 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 they're pièce de résistance. They're, they're, they're not, uh, they're not equivocating the way that Pauline Marois did, uh, or that Lucien Bouchard did, or, yeah, even, or Bernard Landry. Even the Bloc Québécois for years now has been pretty quiet on that, right? Like, and that's, not... that's what's going to be interesting how at the federal level. Right. You take the PQ's position, slap it onto the back of Yves-François Blanchet, uh, and say a vote for the bloc is a vote for separation. So that's what could keep the bloc afloat in Quebec. Or not. Because if you look right. at public opinion polls, more than 60% right. of Quebecers do not want to separate. So then so, why so, is the PQ making this their ballot question? If they Because you have two types of leaders. Leaders that say, tell me where you want to go and I'll take you there. And Paul Saint Pierre Plamondon, because let's not forget, they're down to three seats, four seats in the national right. assembly. Right, and they 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 did historically bad too in the last election, right? Like not just the, the worst result. Right, the like they they the they, Conservative Party of Quebec. We talk Eric Dehoom's party. Didn't they tie them in the popular support? The PQ they, exactly. Uh, so so Pierre, Paul Saint Pierre Plamondon, with only three four seats out of one hundred twenty five, he's gone all in. I mean, that's the one issue that keeps the party together. So his challenge now is, does he scale that back? Or does he go into persuasion mode of convincing Quebecers that Quebec would be better off? You know, we're having this big debate on immigration right now. Justin Trudeau wants to bring in 500,000 new permanent residents um, uh, every year across Canada. If Quebec were to take its percentage of that, that's more than 120,000 people in Quebec every year. Whereas the PQ is saying, no, 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 hold on a second. We're not taking in more than 30,000. So what happens there? <laughs> well, what happens on immigration is that Quebec manages its own immigration system. Uh, so they can shut down how much come in, though? Quebec can say we won't take more than 35,000 or 40,000. Quebec runs its own immigration system. Right. And this was an agreement signed by the the Mulroney government, the Bouchard-Gagnon-Tremblay uh, agreement. Other than refugees, Quebec literally has full control of its immigration system. So look, Dimitri, we're, we're looking at Quebec um, and where Trudeau is here. Can he salvage, can he do something in Quebec? Could he Could he galvanize and eat some of that block vote and take those seats? Because the last election in 2021, uh, his plan, uh, their whole the reason for calling the election is they felt they could grow in Quebec. And that was stopped 
but is, is it something he can do? And it's something he can do in English Canada too. You're obviously a, uh, you, you know, you've been around the, the block and not just in Quebec, but around the country. What can Trudeau do to, to come back? Can he do it? And what is it? Well, sometimes, you know, after almost a decade of governing, uh, the forces of change and the winds of change are so strong that there's literally nothing you can do. Look at 2015 when we lost the election. Um, the government was doing a good job. Um, I, I would say 2015, the biggest challenge was after we won a majority government, um, the prime minister focused primarily on governing and, and could have done more retail politics. Right. Um, but can Trudeau turn this around? Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but a week in politics is an eternity. Elections matter. There's a million and one expressions as to why everything is possible. Having said that, I, th I think something very telling is about to happen or not. So as you know, uh, the law, the electoral law states that after six months that a seat remains vacant, uh, the prime minister must call a by-election. Uh, we're coming up to that timeline, um, I think, in the next week or two yeah, uh, with uh, with Mr. O'Toole's, with Aaron O'Toole's seat uh, out in, in, in Durham. Now, just recently, uh, Carolyn Bennett um, resigned her seat formally. She announced it in December, and I found it curious. She didn't step down as an MP immediately. She stepped down just about a week ago because uh, the prime minister named her uh, as ambassador of Canada to Denmark. So now the there are day, two. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Well, now there are so... two vacancies. Right. Two vacancies in the House of Commons. Traditionally, um, you call both of them at the same time. Almost uh, yeah, unless you're unless you're on the way to calling one and then one drops on you, that's that is now exactly that's the only reason. now the context around St. Paul's is the Liberals have held this seat since 1993. Um we did not win this seat in 2011, even when we won a majority. I mean, St. Paul's is one or of the close. safest yeah. or come close. It's one of the safest liberal seats in the country. Yeah, it's one of those, um, it's like it's almost the equivalent of a Quebec uh, conservative seat, right? In terms of strength. Correct or or regular <laughs> Alberta uh, from yes, a consumer yeah, probably perspective. A better example. So the prime minister, technically speaking, should be calling both of them at the same time because that's what tradition dictates. But also, conservatives are going to win Durham, liberals are going to win St. Paul's. Right, split. If he does not call St. Paul's at the same time as Durham, I can bet you a pretty nickel that their internal numbers are showing that they are in trouble in St. Paul's. And okay, and, but if they're in trouble in St. Paul's. Trudeau needs to take that walk in the snow. <laughs> like if they're, if they don't call that a by-election, if they, if they're worried, they're not going to win St. Paul's in a by-election. This next election's over. Quite possibly. Um, all, all that I'm saying is I'm not convinced St. Paul's will be called. Uh, I'm also hearing that their preferred candidate, PMO's preferred candidate is Leslie Church, a former political staffer. It would have been a good opportunity to go in and recruit somebody to try and freshen up the atmosphere, the environment. Um, all that I'm saying, Fred, is on the day that the writs are dropped uh, for Durham, pay close attention. St. Paul's might not be there. That'll be fascinating. And, and I think, and now that you've said this on uh, on background, uh, we, that nobody's <laughs> listening. No one's listening. <laughs> uh, now that you've said this, it'll be really interesting because uh, I think that'll um, certainly perk a lot of eyebrows um, if that happens. So that's interesting. By the way, I love your show. Uh, I, I, I listen to it on the drive to pick up my kids from school. Awesome. Really appreciate that, uh, Dimitri. And really appreciate you coming on uh, to, to have this chat. And uh, to all of our listeners, please subscribe like Dimitri does. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Love talking about uh, Quebec politics. Always love talking politics in general with you. It's a lot of fun and love to have you on Same again here. someday. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, thanks so much for listening in. Please like and subscribe if you like this episode and, and all the podcasts we're putting out. Uh, having a lot of fun doing this. I want to grow our listener pool, kind of like uh, our voter pool. You know, we're going out there and trying to get as many converts as we can. So please like, subscribe, and uh, send to your friends. And we will see you next week on Background.